Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the daily live stream. It's Catherine Byers Breed, Chief Stripe Changer with our Bez. So I want to kick off this morning for those of you that are joining us a little bit early with some good news. And uh, Chelsea Fair out of Connecticut is 10 years old and she has donated 1,500 art kits. So Chelsea Fair, I wanna give a huge shout out to you. Uh, that came through the Good News Network and I just think it's tremendous at 10 years old that you are making such an impact in the world. And a really cool thing is she's donating these art kits to homeless shelters with women and children that are not just going through an incredibly tough time in their lives, but then you add COVID-19 on top of it and uh, artwork is just, they get these little kits with crayons and coloring pads and all sorts of things. So uh, Chelsea Fair, way to go. And I hope that that inspires others that are listening in today to do maybe a little bit more, maybe reach out, do a little something for your elderly neighbor, your friends, check in on people you haven't checked in on lately. Um, it's actually unbelievable what uh, just a little text or a smile or a phone call can do. And I also want to give a shout out to all of our, especially our healthcare workers that are in the trenches. A friend of mine had a, a curbside concert birthday party last night, and uh, one of the women there is a nurse who's working with, with low-income folks that are really struggling. And I just stopped and I just said, I just want to say thank you so much. And she said, you know, you're the first person who has said that to me since COVID broke out. I was kind of stunned. Um, so thank a healthcare worker today or this weekend. All right. It is 8 a.m. Welcome to the daily live stream. This is Catherine Byers Breet, Chief Stripe Changer with our Bez. I'm showing up every morning to help people with careers, consulting, job search. It's all about getting to that next level in your career. For some of you, you are working full time, you're working hard. For many of you, you are either going through a job loss or you've already, or you're worried about that. And so today, I'm really, really excited to introduce you to our guest. Uh, George Murray is an Army veteran. He has spent 25 years in global operations. He's lived in China, Thailand, Germany. Um, currently, he's VP of Manufacturing and Supply Chain for a global company, uh, Anto Innovation, which is a $540 million publicly traded semiconductor manufacturer. He manages over $200 million in, in annual spend, uh, so he's a busy guy. But... That's not what he's here to talk to you about today. So don't ask him about toilet paper. He is here to talk to you about career transition. So George got laid off twice in three years and the first time didn't go so well and he learned a lot and the second time went much better. And he's here to talk to you about that. George Murray, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm wonderful, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And um, you told me you were going to wear red today. So I wore red as well. So what's that about? Why are we wearing red today? Um, it's actually a, a, an organization that started in 2016. I'm not a part of it. I just support it. It's uh, Remember Everyone Deployed. So it's solidarity for all our soldiers and troops and support those that are out there and waiting for them for a safe return. You know, and I've done a little bit of work. Um, you spent some time in Kuwait, and I actually did some webinars during the recession helping soldiers that were in Kuwait that were coming home to unemployment. And so I just want to take a moment to those of you that are serving our country or deployed around the world. Um, we see you, we care about you, and we are here to help you land, land on your feet when you come back. So thank you so much for your service. So George, you got whacked twice in three years. Oh. Um, Tell us a little bit about that first layoff. Yeah, I think like most that I've networked since, it's like a bus that hits you from nowhere. You know, you, you're you going down the road, you're maybe in the passenger seat and then all of a sudden you wipe out, right? Uh, you don't know why, you get frustrated, you get upset. Um, more importantly, you just don't know what to do next. And you are a self-proclaimed self introvert. Yeah. And you said that was one of the hardest adjustments for you to make during that layoff was to, first of all, recognize that you had to work a little bit harder at networking. And so what did you learn? Um, what are some things that didn't go so well for you that first time? Well, you know, the whole thing as far as just developing a schedule, because you leave a very structured schedule. And I think a lot of times we find out too late in career transition that we have to build that structure up. 
Uh, it starts early in the morning. You know, when we left for work, we did certain things and maybe we exercised, maybe we had a regiment and all that's gone, right? So if you don't turn around and structure that that way, um, that's really the first thing that I learned myself. I kind of looked in the mirror and I said, you know, there's a lot of things that I can't control, but uh, who's going to hire an old, ugly, heavy set guy? And I said, well, I'm going to control the things I can. I started walking and then awkwardly jogging. And in about four or five months, I lost about 40 pounds, started feeling better about myself. And that really helped with my confidence. And then, you know, just really getting out there. That's the thing, you know, a lot of times as an introvert, you know, you just can't get out and talk to people. So you have to develop processes and you have to develop templates that really help you uh, manage the career transition. So your first transition took you 13 months. Yeah. And then your second one took you how long? Five and a half months. And so you're writing a book. Um, mm -hmm. And when's that book going to get out that we can? Uh, it goes to the publisher next week. And they said, uh, can go anywhere from eight to 12 weeks. So I'm really pushing by the end of July. Nice. Well, your timing couldn't be better. Um, and your book is how to cut your job search in half. Um, and so you literally cut your job search time in half. So you, you managed to get through it. You figured a lot of things out. You landed. And then you got laid off again. Was it a, a year and a half, two years later? No, it was actually less than a year. You know, it just went into a situation that, you know, you think it's, you know, this one, this process and, and these challenges, and it turns out to be these challenges, right? You do the best that you can. Um, you add the value, you turn things around, but it wasn't, uh, you know, what the board needed. And uh, the fact was, is that they came in and uh, the CEO that hired everybody underneath them, they just kind of just cleaned house. It happens, right? It's business. It does. It does. You know, it is business, but man, it feels personal when it happens to you. You know, I, I got laid off. I was director of recruiting. Absolutely loved my job. Number one team in the world for this company. So I really thought that I was uh, indestructible. Um, you know, I saw them laying off around the world. This was dot-com bubble burst. And I just, my brain said, get ready. And my heart said, they're not going to let me go. And then wham. Um, so it took me a little while to kind of stand back up again. So what are some of the biggest uh, lessons? I actually, I, you, you've designed a roadmap to helping people land their next role. Why don't I show that and you can walk sure. people through it. Um, then we'd love to take questions from the audience. So let me whip up your uh, outline here. Your roadmap to landing a new role. And this is what you recommend to people when you're, when you're talking about how to land fast. Yeah, you know, I can relate to cars. I think most people can, you know, the first gear is really just trying to recoil from what just happened. You know, whether you take a couple of days or a week to really process that, you have to turn around and uh, really create a story. Well, what happened so that it flows off when somebody asks, because that's the first question either in a network event or in an interview, especially, you know, what happened. You need to make sure it's clear and concise. It's crisp. I think the other thing you also have to do is you have to present uh, and prepare you know, it's going to average, you know, pr prior to the uh, COVID situation, it was averaging seven to 13 months. I can't imagine it now. Um, and then reviewing your financial situation. That's one of the things that I did very late in my first career transition that I wish I had done really up front. And then social media scrub, clean it all up, you know, and then you start to build momentum, you know, building your brand and know that there's a lot of people, including yourself, talk about that. You have to create it. Everybody has a brand. You have to find it. And you have to find your niche and then really own it and drive it. Um, I've always been a non-proponent of the, um, the value or the, excuse me, the elevator pitch, because it's all about what you've done and you're forcing the listener to really try to, how to understand how does that relate to me instead of actually, the, you know, doing your homework the night before the people that you're networking with and then developing a value proposition statement around that. I mean, you literally have 30 seconds to tell me why you're unique and different than the other 12 people that are out in the waiting room waiting to interview this job. You know, That's driving LinkedIn traffic, I think we all know that. Uh, and then, you know, just be yourself. I tell people, you know, I think a lot of times, especially towards that end of that first career transition, you know, you, you, you start to turn around and be desperate. And I think that it, it comes across that way. So you just got to be confident in that. And then you get to third gear, you know, you start to, you know, really ready and prepared to get out there, right? You control what you can, as I talked about, you know, you might want to look in the mirror and say, hey, if I haven't changed my hairstyle in about 20 years, maybe I'll look, I actually cut my hair very short now. 
it just makes me feel a couple of years younger and that helps with your overall confidence, mm -hmm. right? And then, uh, you know, I always tell people, show up, dress up, never give up. I think that that was really a difference from my first career transition to my second because of the fact that what I realized was is that you've got, you're already being judged when you meet someone first seven seconds. And, you know, if you show up in a jeans and a polo shirt, uh, you know, you might not get the best connections and there's already a prejudgment. Yeah. And then, you know, day in the life, you know, like I started off earlier, you have to create that structure. You get up, control the things, you know, meditate, you know, clean all that negative stuff out of your brain because you can be your worst coach in career transition. You know, you're always second guessing yourself as, as time progresses. And so you really need those things. And to me, YouTube was the best free coach during my both career transitions. I'd load up and say, type in, you know, I want to meditate on positive energy. And then I'd follow up with, you know, morning affirmations. I am successful. You know, and, and originally I was very highly skeptical, but somebody that I had networked with that really told it to me like I needed to be told, try it for 30 days. And boy, I can tell you, it has really changed the way I look at life. And you know, the, the, the last couple of, you know, shifts is really, you know, I'm an old school guy. So double clutch is really the process in which maybe your engine or your tires are really go, not working together. So you can make sure that you double clutch. You know, I tell people, you know, every three or four weeks, you should have a stop, start, continue model. Mm -hmm. For one example, I had actually been uh, asked to be challenged to do cold calls, right? You know, that's old school, right? And no one ever to think about that. Um, I actually did it on a dare out of 10 CEOs, seven of them returned my call within days. And Wait I a minute. Said, I want you to say that again. You are an introvert. Yeah who took on a dare, it took somebody double dog daring you to say, yeah. start cold calling CEOs, go straight to the top. So you made a hit list and you called and left voicemails for 10 CEOs and seven of them responded to you. Yeah, the first one was Doug Baker of Echo Labs. Two days later, I was really blown away. And what did he say when he, why did he call you back? He's a CEO of yeah, a global organization. You know, he said, uh, he goes, you know, George, very interesting um, message. I got to commend you. I don't think anybody from an operations perspective has called me and left me a message. More importantly, it was very clear and concise. He said, not rambling on. It was 24 seconds, right? And that's the reason why he goes, so how can I help you? I got his number. I got his cell phone. Still contact him once in a while. I mean, the guy is just a general servant leader. But you also, you called, to, so... And this is one of the things I really was excited for George to talk to you all about. Um, and if you listened into Melissa on Monday of this week, you can get a job by applying online, but it is, it is really, really hard. It's sort of like riding a bike in a bike um, competition without any gears. Speaking of gears, 12% um, of people get hired by applying online, 80% get it through networking and referral and um, you know, so one thing George did was just reach out directly to the decision makers who went to the top of the food chain. Yes, it's uncomfortable. Yes, there are gonna be some people that don't respond to you, but my goodness, 70% of the CEOs he reached out to called him back. But you also sent letters. You sent out, did you say 500 letters? Yeah, so one of the processes that one of Great Network's uh, person and the one that Dog Bill Dog dared me was Greg Rye. A lot of people know him. He actually- Greg, Greg. Uh, yeah, he told me, he said, you know, why don't you send out letters? I'm like, does that really work? Old school stuff really works because very few people do. So what I did was I took the business journal as well as the uh, Star Tribune section of the business section of, of the Monday where they actually identified the movers and the shakers. And I just wrote a couple of lines congratulating them, maybe pulled a, a certain data point from the, uh, the company to share with them so that it said, hey, I took some time. And then a couple of lines was my value proposition statement. I'd love to turn around and meet with you. I dumped 50 letters in the mailbox for 10 weeks, representing 10 a day, Monday through Friday. And out of, out of those 500, 400 people reached back out by Thursday, Friday that week and said, hey, you know, no one's ever sent me a letter. I don't think I've gotten one in years. I only get uh, bills and so forth. So, you know, it's... It, I, 
I learned so much in career transition and so many great people. It was really a positive thing in, in a tough uh, situation. You know, you got to look at it from a positive perspective. And um, what I often say to people is that you got to ask yourself the question, what's the worst that can happen? Because there's so much fear around reaching out to strangers. And um, some people aren't gonna see your message. Some people are gonna be uncomfortable networking and they're not gonna be very helpful. But my goodness, in my experience, about 70% of people respond and they're helpful and they're actually excited to help you. And I gotta tell you guys, in a down economy, people are much more motivated to help you. We've got some uh, comments coming in from our uh, audience today. So Lori is just, uh, sort of celebrating your message about um, everything, your haircut, exercise, mantra, and attitude, that, that mental attitude and how important that is, uh, and the power of simplicity. So she really likes, you know, two things you've shared. Um, I want to let you talk about your fourth gear, and then we got some questions from the audience. You know, before I get to fourth gear, what I didn't mention was, is that, you know, always take this process very humbly, you know, so you know, a lot of people are out there on the sidelines, but there's still jobs to be had, but don't think that that job's beneath you. I think one of the things that the military really taught me was, is that at the end of the day, I can screen, I can scrub a mean toilet, right? So my first career transition, not only doing all that networking, you know, and I went through a lot of cash. I mean, over a hundred thousand dollars of cash in those two transitions. So I took a part-time job at Home Depot as a plumbing supervisor. And in that time frame, I learned more about plumbing than I had in the first 48 years of my life. Um, I also worked at uh, Amazon at nights, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 12-hour shifts. I hadn't worked third shift in about 15 years. And that was really tough. But you know, you got to do what you got to do. Because at the end of the day, it's what you are going to provide your family. It's not how somebody's going to perceive you to provide your family. Yeah, and I, boy, I've been in this business 22 years and worked with, you know, over 100,000 people, many of them in transition, and a lot of them, you VP, you're a global VP of operations, and there you are working at Home Depot and stocking shelves at Amazon. A lot of people say to me, well, I can't do that. I can't take a part-time job that I could do in high school. People are going to look down on me. Actually, the exact opposite is true. People in your network, your friends, your family, people that you're meeting for the first time are going to have tremendous admiration for you for doing whatever you can to make some money right now. So number one, let go of that worry about criticism and judgment and shame. And number two, people are going to have such admiration for you. You know, and then and finally, the fourth gear is really just bringing it all home. You know, what, one of the things that helped me through all of it was creating a personal board of advisors. These are three to five people that you can really, you know, express your frustration without having to turn around and give that first impression to somebody that just met you. Um, they can help you with other connections. They can prompt you up. Um, there's so much to be said. And those people, I still, after five years, are still on that board. And I still talk to them quite frequently. Um, I always tell people, Uber networkers, you know, there's a lot of people out there like the Lennies, the Jennies of the world that just are super givers, you know, as far as um, giving people the next pathway to their opportunity. Um, and then being an ideal candidate, you know, every step, I was always providing them the, the interview or something, you know, I always gave them a value proposition statement. Uh, at the end of uh, the final round, I gave, you know, my 90 day plan. And I can tell you that, uh, that's how I got my job here was I went direct to the CEO. A couple of days later, we talked. And a couple of weeks later, I got an offer. And I, in that process, I gave him the 90-day plan. He says it was based on how you presented yourself as well as that 90-day plan just sealed the deal. Absolutely. And you said something a little earlier that is just worth really underscoring. And it's when you're out there networking and reaching out to people, it's really about them. The, the, your first goal when you're reconnecting with somebody for the, you know, oh, it's been years or reaching out to somebody new, you really need to think what's in it for them. Um, I was 24 years old. I was out networking for the first time at some big event with a bunch of people in thousand dollar suits, way more experienced and wise and confident than me. I was really insecure and didn't know what to do with myself. And some guy came up to me and looked down at me and said, so who are you and why should I care? <laughs> and I, I absolutely freaked out. I blubbered at him. I spit out a couple of words and I said, I'll be back. And I ran to the bathroom, 
tried to pull myself together and I couldn't. So I went and jumped in my car and went home. <laughs> but you know what? He gave me a gift. He asked me the two questions that everybody really wants to know about you, whether it's networking or interviewing, who are you and why should I care? How do you fit into my life? And so finding common ground, you talk about doing your homework before you meet with somebody. Um, it's really, really important. So um, and the last thing I tell people, you know, that first network, it's it, and you said it, it's all about them. I always manage it in a 70-30. I'm going to speak 30% of the time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, my value proposition, and clearly what I'm looking for. But then I'm going to spend 70% of the time listening to you. Because we live in a society right now where we listen to respond. So if you can turn around and find somebody that's truly listening to you, taking notes, right, and then following up after that and saying, hey, I really appreciate that, you've already beat 80% of the people that are out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, all right, Melissa is excited about your upcoming book. She wants to know where, where can she get your roadmap? His roadmap is going to be available as a free download uh, today. So you can get this roadmap from him um, at the end of the webinar. It'll be in the description on our website at ourbez.com. But the book, when and where, what's the best way for them to get be the first to find out about when your book is published? Yeah, um, just follow my LinkedIn profile. You can follow me. Um, I've, I've dwindled it down to two publishers. I'll be talking to them uh, early next week. Um, all right. So Jane has a question. In your letter to the CEOs and to other people, did you mention that you were unemployed? No. Thank you for that. Um, here's the deal about leading with, I'm unemployed, I'm looking for a job. If you just got divorced and you're meeting somebody cute for the first time, is the first thing out of your mouth going to be, I just got divorced? No. You're going to focus on them and just sort of building a relationship. I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to ever, um, you know, hide the fact that you're unemployed, but just don't lead with it. It's not the first topic of conversation. I do not support putting seeking employment at the top of your LinkedIn profile. The first impression that you want to make is here's what I can do for you. Um, I promise you, it'll come out in the conversation. You know, when people ask you, what are you up to? What do you do for work? Please don't say I'm unemployed. Tell them what you do. In the summer, when a teacher is not working, does a teacher say I'm unemployed? No, they say I'm a teacher. When a doctor isn't cracking somebody's chest open, they don't say I'm in between paychecks. They say I'm a doctor. Um, so you are everything today that you were yesterday, last month, last year. Introduce yourself as the person who can solve their problems you know, show up and be a, a productive member of their team. Just wait to share the fact that you're in between paychecks because that's not the point. The point is, what do you do for a living? What do you do really, really well? Um, okay, so Pete would like you to elaborate a little bit on the value prop versus the old fashioned elevator pitch. Maybe give an example. Well, you know, the old elevator pitch sounds just like Charlie Brown's teacher. You know, it's like, I'm an executive that's got 20 years experience, want, 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 right? Instead of saying, you know, for example, uh, how I introduced myself here at uh, uh, Rudolph slash not onto was, is that I'm a rappel master. Much like my military career, I drop into difficult situations. I assess the group, develop a collaborative strategy, and I execute the plan. Do you know anybody that needs a rappel master? And the CEO is just like, uh, I don't know what that rappel master is, but I think we need one. Right. So it's really unique. It brings something personal to you, but it actually it shows a value that you can create in the energy you can create within an organization. Yeah, it's like I had an IP attorney on yesterday who happens to be my brother and um, he used to be a firefighter. You know, he used to fight fires. Now he's focused on preventing them for businesses. There you go. Um, um, I, I know a guy who used to be a pirate hunter. He literally was in the military hunting pirates. He said, I used to be a pirate hunter. Now I hunt for business problems. Um, so dare to have a little bit of fun. Your value proposition is focused on the business, what you can do for your next employer, whether you're a consultant or looking for full time. Um, short, sweet, to the point, you don't even have 30 seconds People really don't have the attention span. If you haven't hooked them with, I'm a rappel master, if you haven't hooked them in the first 10 seconds, they might be smiling at you. They're tuned out and they're thinking about their grocery list. Um, so grab them, dare to have a little bit of fun. And Pete, yeah, I got to tell you, I, I was scared to call my company Zebra Backwards 
and call myself a stripe changer. But I just decided to own it, step into my own skin and have a lot of fun with it. And a lot of people look at me like I'm weird, but then they lean in and they ask about it. And it gives me a chance to share my story, what it means and connect it to them. Um, all right. So another question, Doug would like to know, what are your thoughts on overcoming age bias? I think you said you were 48 the first time you got laid off. Then the next time you were in your 50s. What, what, how do you overcome age bias? Any you know, there's no doubt that there is a perception of that happening. But the fact is, is that I tell people all the time, it says, don't act your age, right? Show the energy, enthusiasm, a positive attitude. I see a lot of executives that really just kind of have taken the back seat to their career and their lives. And it, it shows as they come across. Nice. If they're, like you stated, they're leaning in. They're, they're being a little bit more unique than that whole elevator pitch. Hey, this person is a lot different than the rest of the person. Tell me more. I want to understand more. Yeah, Definitely so your hair shorter, maybe <laughs> cut some of the gray out. Yeah, so um, I, for those of you that are concerned about age discrimination, I am doing a webinar through the state of Minnesota. So if you're a Minnesota, I'm sorry, it's Minnesota residents, residents only. Uh, you don't have to be unemployed. It's through the state of Minnesota, Career Force, Minnesota. And I'm doing a webinar in two weeks, a week and a half not this next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after that on age discrimination during the job search. So if you're a Minnesotan, um, go to Career Force MN and register now. It's a hot topic. So we're probably gonna sell out um, and we're gonna spend an hour talking about what to do about it. Bottom line, George said it at the top of the hour, figure out what you, what you can control and act on it and let go of the rest. Age, racial, gender, religious, any discrimination that, that you're encountering out there, shame on those people, nothing you can do about it. You don't want to work for them anyway, and you're certainly not going to change their mind. So let it go. Focus on what you can control. I do want to tell you, when the hair goes up on your neck and you think you're encountering age discrimination, 95% of the time it's something else. You're worried about age discrimination, so you're probably assuming that you're too old and you're walking in like this and you're looking for it. And when something goes funky in the conversation, you immediately assume it's an age thing. 95% of the time, it's something entirely different. You just have to trust me on that. I've interviewed thousands of people. I've hired hundreds. And so often, it's an age thing. No, it isn't. You told them that you really did were, wish you were retired. That's not about your age. That's about you told them you really don't want to work. That's the problem. So anyway, just you can't change it. Don't worry about it. I promise you it's not happening as often as you think. Focus on what you can do for them. What do they need you to get in there and do and solve? Why do they need to hire you? Focus on that. Bring your energy and excitement, even if you would rather be retired. Find one or two things that you can be excited about about the company, what they're doing in the world. So George, what did you say to Onto Innovation? When you called that CEO and you got a chance to talk to the CEO, what was something that you said that expressed your excitement about their business? Yeah, I just, I actually, I did my homework the night before on the, on the company itself. So I went into a little bit greater detail. I went into the 10K, you know, and I said, I think that I can bring value in an operation setting that you're struggling with and identify those partic particular specifics. And I actually wrapped that up in my final 90 day. This is how I will approach it the first 90 days. And he had stated, he goes, you know, I've been a CEO for quite some time and I've been interviewing a lot of people. He goes, that's probably one of the few times I've seen somebody actually bring a 90 day plan. It's written about, it's talked about everywhere, but very few people do it. Absolutely. Um, it's really powerful. And any single, even if you're a receptionist, it doesn't matter what level you are, you can think about what would I like to accomplish in my first 90 days on this job, lay it out in a one page plan and you will knock your competition flat. Um, so as we wrap things up here, I've got a question from Niku who said, so George says he's an, an introvert. How do you overcome that when you're trying to find a job? Well, you know, the motivation is, is that you're unemployed. So you've got to do something, right? You can't just sit and wait for it. You can't just add, uh, you know, hours to uh, submitting jobs online, because I think in my second career transition, I submitted three resumes and one was for this job during those five and a half months. So it's really, you just, you've got to have some internal, I call it intestinal fortitude that pushes you out there and you just got to figure out, you know, Hey, I'm old, I'm comfortable in my skin, get comfortable, make sure that your, you know, your um, value proposition is, is crisp 
because when people leave the, the coffee shop, they're not going to remember the person who's got 20 years experience in MBA, blah, 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 blah. They remember, you know, the rappel master or the firefighter or the pirate, you know, hunter. Absolutely. And there's a famous quote, and I think it was by Maya Angelou, who said, people don't remember what you said, they remember how you made them feel. And so that, I think that's a beautiful way to wrap things up today as you're out there on the hunt for your next big adventure, whether you're unemployed or not, or just getting ready for that next move. A lot of you are working right now and realizing you don't want to go back to what you're doing. Whatever it is that brought you to the conversation today, um, get out there and just tell yourself, say, listen, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just going to reach out to this person. What's the worst that can happen? They're not interested in talking to me. Ah, so what? That'll free me up to go find somebody who is. And I promise you, there are plenty of people out there who would love to help you find your next big, fantastic opportunity. Um, so George, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I know you're working full time and probably full tilt. So thanks for joining us this morning. Cannot wait to see your book hit the virtual shelves. And um, so follow him. You can reach out to him on LinkedIn. And again, you're going to be able to get his free download today. And uh, George, thank you. Any final comments you want to share with people? Yeah, Catherine, I appreciate it. It's such an honor. I, Like I said, we met back in 2016. And so it sounds like I've actually reached the pinnacle. <laughs> and then just a, sh a shout out to my uh, virtual happy hour team, Jenny Jeffords, Lenny Newman, Sarah Sampson, Chris Cobalt, Lisa Fraga. We'll see you guys this afternoon. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a really, really nice long weekend. You earned it.